Hey, I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in to Other Things with Mark Maxwell. I am so thrilled to have Mark Maxwell on the show today. Let me read his bio, and it's in his new book. We're going to talk a lot about his new book, but uh, it's a he's a renaissance man. Let me say that. Mark H. Maxwell is an entertainment attorney, music business veteran, and college professor. As a lawyer, Mark represents a diverse uh, roster of recording artists, celebrities, record labels, music publishers, authors, songwriters, and producers. I'm not sure that there's anything left. Uh, <laughs> that's just about everything in the creative arts industry. As a professor in Belmont University's prestigious entertainment business and songwriting program, he created their popular course on Bob Dylan and teaches courses in music business, faith and culture and copyright law. And if we have time towards the end of the podcast, maybe Mark will give us just his insight on Bob Dylan. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, but of Mark course. is passionate about, Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Mark is passionate about serving as a mentor to the next generation of creatives and entertainment business professionals. He lives in Nashville with his wife and his children. How are you doing my friend? Very good, Kenny. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor. It's a thrill. I, I want to ask right up front, your book is entitled Network Kills, Success Through Serving. And uh, when this actually is uh, viewed, we're going to have a picture of your, your book there on the, the video so people will see what I'm talking about. But I did want to ask you right up front, I read there in the book, evidently your son uh, did the artwork for the cover. Is that correct? It is. He did. Awesome. Does he is he into that or is he just that gifted? He's gifted. He's he's primarily a photographer. He he tours with different artists. He's been out on the road with Lecrae and David Crowder and different people doing photography. Oh, and and but he does a little bit of design as well. So he 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 took care of all that for me. That's awesome. It was really, really well done. And I was thrilled to see. So he's the second, is that right? Yes. Okay. That's yeah. big shoes to fill. Oh, uh, well, thanks. <laughs> Hey, let's just get right into it. Uh, Mark has a book. It's been out a few years, but it's still very relevant and people are talking about it. And once you hear a little bit more about the book, I think you're going to want to check it out or to buy it. Uh, it's really everywhere. I actually got it through the public library and checked it out. It's on Amazon. Everywhere you can find a book, you're going to find Mark's book. And uh, I'm thrilled about it. But let, let me ask you, just getting right into it, Mark. Um, in your book, you write, you are there, and this is talking about the creative artist, the person who's on stage. You are there to love and serve your audience. Your voice, musicianship, melody, and lyrics make up a beautiful, supernatural creative gift, and you are vulnerably serving your audience by offering joy, hope, perspective, empathy, and love, a gift to transform their hearts and lives that night and beyond. It's always about the audience and not about you as the artist. That's a profound statement. Once the audience understands the power of that gift and makes that his or her um, primary focus, instead of finding his or her identity and the applause, then the spotlight becomes a place of love with the, uh, with the risk of failure or without, I guess the risk of failure, maybe wrote that down wrong, but I want to ask you uh, that's really a mission statement for the creative arts is the way I see it. Uh, who do you see today that models this attitude and perspective in the entertainment world and the music world? I say that is because I spent a lot of time both as an attorney and as a professor counseling creatives and helping them think through things. And so a lot of times they're dealing with what is it like to be in front of an audience? They're dealing with stage fright. They're dealing with things that would cause them to think inwardly about, am I doing everything perfectly? Do I look right? Did I sing perfectly? And what I've always tried to teach them is to say, there's a different approach to that. And you've got to really see the stage as a platform of serving, as, a, as opposed to a platform of gaining your identity and uh, focus from, uh, and, and just where, where, where you're, the applause becomes your meter of success. And really your mm -hmm. meter of success should be about giving and serving others with the gifts that you have. And so somebody who, I, I, honestly, it's interesting because um, I was talking about this very issue with someone recently and i think a real great example of this and one of the reasons he's still successful 30 gosh probably 30 years into his career is toby mack he's a guy who still um you know dc talk was popular in the early 90s he's still out there touring in 2022 still has really big audiences um now the people that grew up with him 
when they were kids are now bringing their kids and maybe sometimes their grandkids to see Toby Mac. But part of the reason I think people still want to go and, and see him and pay money and spend time with him for two or three hours a night at a show is because he loves his audience so well. His audience is really important to them, the way he communicates to them, how he cares for, for them. And I think people come away from those shows feeling like this guy's real. He's sincere. He has something important to say. He has value for me and he really cares about me and he treats his, his audience with respect. And I think you'll find that with a lot of these artists, you know, whether they're Christian, a mainstream rock act or whatever. But a lot of these artists that are still out there doing it 30 or 40 years later, most times you'll find there's something really special between them and their audience and the way they've learned to really give of themselves and to make people feel really special at a concert um, or just anytime they would interact with them. You know, um, Amy Grant's the other big one. I think Amy is one of those people I, I've heard so many stories over the years where she will have met someone at a concert in some random city and she'll be back there years later and that person will be talking to her at the uh, at the t-shirt table and Amy will remember their name. She'll remember their story. And so she has a way about really going deep with people and recalling them and, and understanding what they're about. And so to see um, all the years that she has just continued to, to sow into her audience, I think that's a big part of it. Well, you know, that's encouraging because so many people, or at least in people that I talk to, they seem to have uh, at times a negative opinion about performers or artists and questioning their um, their sincerity and, and some even losing hope that anyone in the industry is sincere and to hear that there are people that, that really do care and who really are modeling uh, what you really have defined, I think, as a well uh, thought out uh, you know, mission statement or a plan uh, for the artist uh, if they're going to really be successful. And I would, I would agree with you on all of that. I think it's outstanding. Um, I saw Toby Mac years ago in concert and uh, blew the, blew the doors off. And then his uh, singer, uh, Leon Patillo's, Leon Patillo's son, Gabe, Patillo. Gabe, I met Gabe at the halftime and, you know, he's built like a rock. And I said, dude, I said, you know, how do you move like you do? It's just, you know, you're, you're, you're massive, like a weightlifter and yet bouncing around like a rubber ball, flipping and flopping and singing. So, um, but cool people. And it did, it did really come through, uh, in chapter two on watch your step in regards to the counsel that, that you, this counsel that you give people that you teach, uh, artists that you represent, uh, even people in the business world, um, I want you to share with me some situations or settings where you were or are able to approach this aspect of life focus with artists across the belief spectrum, because of course, not everybody in the industry is a uh, professing Christian that may be of another religious background, but uh, what's your experience as far as being able to communicate this openly uh, in the settings that you find yourself as a professional? I'll give a couple of examples and I'll give you in the classroom, there's sort of one approach. And then as an attorney, there's a different approach in the classroom as a, as a college professor, I'm fortunate to be at a school that does have a kind of a Christian root and value. Um, and so it gives me the opportunity to be pretty open about my faith, but Belmont's a school that probably attracts, I'd say it probably attracts 60% of the student population. I would say are probably not Christians. Um, maybe maybe 30 or 40 are, but it gives me the opportunity to be very open about my faith in the classroom. And one of the ways I do it, even in a class, like a class on Bob Dylan's songwriting, is um, I think my stories about my life naturally come through. And if since God is the, the sort of the top priority and focus of my life, those stories naturally flow through. But one of the things I've done since my first day as a professor at Belmont 12 years ago, is I pray at the top of every class. The first night I walked onto campus, I was getting ready to teach a three hour class and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I think the first night I was mostly praying out of my own nervousness. But as I walked in, God just gave me a, a vision for here's a way I'm here to serve this, this next generation and serve these students. So I'm going to start from the very first word I'm out of my mouth to let them know that I'm there to care for them and serve them. And what's the best way and the highest way I can do that. And so I start every class that I teach, no matter what topic I teach on, I start by praying for my students there in the room. And it just sort of sets the tone and says, Hey, this is not about me. 
This is about you guys. I want to see you blessed this week. I want to see God meet your needs in your life. And it's just a great way. And it's interesting because I'll often have students who may not be comfortable with that at first. And you can sense it on their face. It's like, oh, my goodness, this professor's praying for me. This time. <laughs> I'm not sure how I feel about that. But it's usually by the end of the semester, even the ones that were most uncomfortable about it will, will come up and they'll tell me how that was the most one of the most important things for them based on the things that they were dealing with that semester and how just my prayers brought them to a place of peace and just comfort in those moments of just busyness of life in, in that classroom. Um, it's funny because I'll have some students, I had one student last year who um, he says, because I always invite my students to have coffee um, outside of class and I really want to spend time to get to know them that way. And he said, I really want to connect with you to have coffee, but he, he goes, you know, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe you, you got to promise me that you're not going to try to convert me. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, number one, I don't ever try to convert anybody. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And um, but but I but just know that, um, I, you know, I'm going to tell you my story. But that's that's his that's his job and his purpose. But it was interesting. By the end of our coffee together, um, uh, you know, I was looking for ways. OK, here's a young man who doesn't want me to share my faith with him. But what, what, how can I, how, how can I talk about the Lord in a way that would open his heart? So we just started talking about some of his passions in life. And it was really interesting because one of his passions is to serve in a local food pantry and he does it regularly. Mm -hmm. And it brings him a lot of, just a lot of purpose and meaning. And I said to him, I said, well, wait a second. I said, that's not natural. I mm -hmm. said, that desire within you, that's because you were created in the image of God and the purpose that you're finding and serving people through that thing. He looks at me for a long time. He goes, you know what? I got to agree. I think you have a good point there. So it was a great way to just help him, even someone who didn't believe in the existence of God, to all of a sudden go, wait a second. Maybe there is something more. Maybe I am indeed created in his image. Um, in terms of my legal clients, I do have... I'd say a large majority are Christians just because I think I, I started in the Christian music industry. I typically get referrals, even if they're not making Christian films or Christian music, if they're doing other forms of music, very more times than not, they are believers. But I do occasionally have clients who aren't believers. And again, those are just great ways to, you know, I always feel like one of the first ways you show someone the Lord is with your work ethic and the, qual the quality of your work and the excellence of your work and your work ethic. Um, because I think it's what we're called to do is to do things, do things and do it well. And, um, and oftentimes with those kind of clients, same sort of thing, you know, they're facing a situation in their life. Um, almost anyone, no matter where they are on their faith journey or lack of it will receive prayer. It's funny. That's yes. one of the things where people are going through difficult things, or things they're trying to figure out. Like oftentimes I'm working with a young artist. Should I sign this record agreement with this, with this, this label? Who knows? It may work out. It may not, you know, we, we're going to do the best we can with the contract, but there's so many variables. Why don't we pray about this? Let's just pray that, that God's going to give us wisdom about some of these decisions we're trying to make and, and faced with that or faced with a crisis. So many young creatives that I work with are like, yeah, Go ahead. You pray. Thank you so much. And they receive it as a gift, even when they are, even when they may not, even, they may not know where they really stand in terms of their own faith. So um, it's an honor for me I, as an attorney and really as a professor. I feel like my major gifting that comes through with both of those parts of my career is um, being a counselor. You know, I, I feel like I, I can teach, I can draft contracts, but to be able to come alongside someone and say let me help give you some advice on, on where you're going here or these decisions you're getting ready to make and uh, so it's a bit of a kind of a father role it's a bit of a mentor role but functioning in that role as a counselor there, there's just so many special ways where you can bring your faith into, the, into those discussions when people are trying to make important life decisions and they want it you know oftentimes it doesn't come it doesn't come down to the money you know i always say um, when you're looking at a contract, young person's looking at a contract, you know, the people are more important than the paper. So if the people you're getting ready to go into business with don't have character, they're not going to do what they say, wow. they're not trustworthy, 
doesn't matter how good the contract is, you know, in terms of the financial part of it. I'm always like, you know, go with the people. I don't care if the if the terms and the royalties and the, and the, and the fees are not as good as this other one. But if you have a, a sense about these people and their character and you, their reputation is high, you're going to go so much further than the contract with the with the great financial terms. And so that's always a hard, that's always a lesson that a lot of people, some people don't take it. Some people don't receive that. They'll go for the money when they make that decision. But I'm always like, let's, let's find a partner here. You want to be entering into contractual relationships with people that really feel like a partnership. They really do have your interest, your best interest in mind as well. So. Uh, I'm so thrilled to hear what you're sharing as people listen to this and watch this to catch a vision for the fact that they can be themselves in their professions without fear and they can be successful by being themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it seems to me that the fact that you are this way and uh, you're, you're being successful in a very uh, difficult industry that uh, I think it does say a, a receptivity that uh, is contagious. And uh, I've seen the same thing in our ministry that we have to people that are uh, in, in poverty and in hurt and uh, they're open, their minds are open, even if they don't believe uh, as far as what we believe about, about God, that their hearts and their minds are open. As a matter of fact, I told someone I've never been rejected. I've never been resisted. And uh, the people who call themselves Christians so many times live in fear that if they're overt or not, not necessarily overt, that sounds like, uh, you know, like a project I'm talking about just being themselves and letting their faith show through. Uh, that's, that's encouraging. Let yeah. me ask you, uh, you write networking has become a deceptive and broken substitute for time honoring, often isolated, passionate work in developing craft and expertise. You're going to say, and that networking has become a distraction and an inhibitor in the creative development process. And I fully agree with that. Um, uh, I mean, with the advent of, you know, I've got an, I, uh, a MacBook Pro and a digital mic and I can broadcast across the world, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a person has talent. Uh, and you go on to say, uh, becoming a creative who can generate works with lasting cultural impact requires a combination of working for extended periods of time with full concentration on the single task, free from distraction. Or interruption followed by intermittent rounds of feedback, which I think is, is imperative, with creative abilities improving by the mental strain that accompanies that deep work. And when you say that, it makes me think of the word enclave. And the God's been dealing with me that, about that a lot lately. And the fact that what we're lacking is enclaves. And I just, from your perspective, what you're seeing on the landscape right now, do you see any enclaves or creative communities developing? or in existence where young artists can find support in that developmental endeavor? I mean, do you see that happening or, or in, in what ways do you see that happening? Now, I'll just tell you briefly why the book was written. I, I used to, for years at Belmont, I would I began giving a lecture. Um, and I used to call the, the lecture networking is a four letter word. And, and eventually when I, I, I didn't feel like that was the right title for the book, but I, I basically, I saw how, young college students were getting so much pressure. There was one professor, you would land in his classroom and the first day of class with an 18 year old freshman sitting there, he would say, okay, get it, get, get, you know, get out your laptops, write this down. This is the most important thing you're gonna hear in the next four years of your college, college education. And he'll say, if you don't start networking today, you won't have a job when you graduate four years from now. And students are all writing that down. And they're going, what does that even mean? I'm terrified. What do I have to do? And so, so many students, and this is, you know, it's the same message of so many business podcasts. It's the message of so many business books these days, certainly on college campuses. It's all, and, and, and really with, um, with music and other media, it's all about how many influencers, how many people you've met, how do you, how do you gain this number of followers? How do you network to find this job? All these things. And the problem, and I just began to see not only the weight of that concept, I mean, it was exhausting. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. one out of a hundred college students love it because they love to get out and they love to meet everyone. They love to just, you know, whatever. The other 99 are going, oh, that feels terrible. 
you know, it's like, it, it's so gross to go to an event like that, thinking that way. And so I begin to say, okay, let me look at my own career as, as an entertainment attorney. And let me look at what does the Bible say about success in life? Where am I going to find success and purpose in life as a believer? What is, you know, Jesus is the, is, is the wisest person who ever lived. So what, what does he say about success? So I just began to look at it from that standpoint. And, you know, Jesus story, which is, which is so fitting and it fits exactly with today's culture is, you know, you have James and John comes to Jesus with their mom, you know, mom comes in, here's the, 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 the greatest stage uh, mom ever, right? She makes uh you know, she makes Christian Jenner look like a beginner. She, she actually comes to the King of Kings with her two teenage boys and says, I want you to put them uh, on your, on your right and your left. And Jesus like is astonished. He can't even believe that she would ask this. And then he goes on to say, well, you know what? Here, here's what's going to happen. You know, if they, as you humble yourself and as you become a servant, you become successful, you become great. Greatness is found through humility and through service of others. And so that was Christ's answer to finding success and leadership. So I think that's, that's really the role that we need to look at. And so I began to kind of I created sort of a lecture on that topic that I would give to students every semester. And it was compelling because at the end, they'd be like, Professor Maxwell, I cannot believe how this removes this weight off of my shoulders. What you've described here, I can do that. Because I don't say stay home and don't go out. I'm like, number one, if you're going to be going out to something, check your heart, check your motivation. Why are you going to a certain event? Is it for you, are you going to, to give, you know? So ask yourself. And then when you give, if you're going to a concert or a conference or an event to go hear someone speak, instead of looking for the most popular person in the room and the most influential person in the room, walk into the room and look for the person who's there who's, who's more uncomfortable than you are. Look for the person who's lonelier in the room. Look, look for the person in the room that no one else is talking to, because that's probably why you're there at that event. And so make it an opportunity to encourage someone else, to connect with someone, to love them as opposed to, to, to take from them, to take a contact from them, to take information from them. And so as I begin to teach on that topic, I would often give that lecture most semesters. I always had students say, Professor Maxwell, you need to turn that into a book. You gotta, <laughs> and, find, and I always laughed at them until finally God one day said, yeah, Professor Maxwell, you do need to turn it into a book. I was like, okay, yes, Lord. And, and that's when I actually... Did it. But in terms of the reception of it, it's definitely been, for the most part, I really tried to write the book. I tried not to use typical Christianese language, but I certainly wanted to include because I didn't feel like the book doesn't hold together without a biblical worldview. It's, it really requires a biblical worldview to embrace all that I'm talking about. But I tried to communicate it in a way where I could hand it to a student, a high school grad, college grad. 20 something who's trying to get his business started and try, trying to figure out how do I grow my business where I could hand it to them, whether they were a Christian or not, and that they would still be able to embrace it. And honestly, most of what I found is they have, and, and certainly more Christians than not have read it, but I've had a number of young people who are not believers, who've read the whole thing, who love the values, who love the concepts, and they get it because ultimately, again, the image of God is in all of us. And I think there's something about when you give mm -hmm. something to someone else, whether you're a Christ follower or not, there is true, profound purpose in that. And, and you find uh, it, it, there's joy in, in those moments. So, you know, now there are certainly a few people out there where I would call them networking is their religion. <laughs> so I stepped on their toes a little bit, which honestly, I wanted to do that. And I've had a couple of people, um, even in interviews like this, who've come pretty hard at me and, and sort of tried to discount my my view and say, well, with, without that, you can't start a new business or without this, you can't find a job. And so I, I've really taken as an opportunity to say, well, let me sh show you some different approaches that I think can help you with all these things without exploiting others, without collecting relationships, without collecting contacts, you know, without getting just likes, views and followers. Let's think, let's think about some of this differently. So I've enjoyed that challenge. I've had a few people who've you know, kind of written nasty things about me, but that's okay. I guess that it's a sign you're doing something right. If everybody likes what you're doing, you're probably not doing it right. So, um, but it's, it's, it's been, it's been an awesome thing. And, and it's funny because 
I have a number of different book ideas, and this was not the one I ever would have thought I would write first, but it was something, again, God gave me as an assignment. And um, and certainly you, you see my love for music history kind of woven through a lot of the examples in it. Because honestly, I would have thought when my first book would have been, uh, you know, a book on a bio on one of my favorite artists or something like that. So I tried to include a much, as much of those kinds of things into it as well, with the hopes that that would be um, interesting to a lot of young young people as well. Well, and you say that my youngest son, Joseph, he has a habit of buying uh, autobiographies for me of musicians because, you know, I grew up in music. Uh, I, I played clarinet in, in uh, junior high, contrabass clarinet in high school. I was first chair all, first chair all state in Texas, which is a big deal. I mean, I could have gone to any symphony, uh, but now you know why both of my sons started out as pianists, then drummers, then guitarists, because uh, with contrabass, you can go to symphony or clarinet. You can be uh, down on Beale Street, but uh, you know. But but really, the things that you you say, I see modeled in these people. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, I loved his autobiography. And to hear the years that he he toured the Jersey Shore and uh, when his picture ended up on Time and Newsweek and he said, the Fed said, Wait, who is this? Right. <laughs> he never paid, I don't know, you probably read the book. Yeah, never paid any, ta yeah, never paid any taxes. Sure. Never, <laughs> never had a, never signed a contract, nothing. And they came to him, you remember, uh, for all of the back taxes for him and for all of his band. And he paid it because he said, you know, nobody in the band had any money to pay right. seven years of back taxes. But. I, I see in that selflessness. And of course, um, you know, back when I was on staff at a church, where I went to one of our uh, meeting adult age uh, department socials and Bruce Springsteen was the artist at the uh, Super Bowl. And what shocked me because, you know, I'm 62 now, I was probably in my fifties then they were all in their sixties and it's like, shh, 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 you know, right. and I mean, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to hear the boss. And I'm like, these people know Bruce Springsteen, but I think it's because the very things you're, you know, talking about that, that he does emulate and yeah. uh, he gives it his all and it's about the people and, uh, you know, the, the, the attitude of having the proper attitude towards why we do things. Um, but that's so encouraging. Um, a couple of key questions. How do you see the element? And this is a side note, but you talk about Belmont. I know Belmont, you know, is not cheap. Uh, Dallas Baptist University, where I graduated from, both my kids graduated with music business degrees. It was not cheap, but, uh, you know, in your work with college students, what is your view towards the looming student loan debt and its impact on creativity, the arts in general, and the capability for young aspiring artists to cross the genres, whether it be in writing or music or what have you, the performing arts or the arts in general, um, to have a hope of a future, you know, to to aspire realistically to have a future of hope? What, what are you feeling, and especially you're entrenched there at the university and been there several years? Do you have any feedback on that or, or thoughts, you know, that you can share with us? Yeah, I always say, you know, part of it, I think, you know, if you're a believer and a Christ follower, I think it's it, it really it's a big decision for maybe you, maybe your parents, if they're helping to support you to do that. And, and part of it is saying, is this really God's assignment for me? Because it is a huge investment, at, you know, and, and, and for some people, it's it's too big of an investment. Um, neither one of my kids went to college. My daughter went to a, a ministry school and my son was about to uh, start sort of a uh, junior college program the month he graduated from high school. And then he had an opportunity to go on the road with Lecrae to be a photographer. And we felt like being on the road with an artist like that was better school for him if he was going to build a photography business. I, you know, wasn't really convinced that most photographers need a college education, you know, same thing with my daughter. She's a, she's done mostly missions work and she's a songwriter and things like that. So college was not something that she really felt compelled to do. But for me, you know, I, I paid off my last student loan at Baylor the, the, the month I started law school at age 33. <laughs> and then, you know, I paid off law school probably, gosh, maybe when I turned 50, I think so. <laughs> Most of my life, I've been paying off college debts. And for me, it was it was what God called me to. And my, my family couldn't afford to pay for college. So I incurred uh, a lot of debt. Um, and certainly those are difficult amounts to take care of. But 
but they have they were good investments they were so i think it really depends on the family you know i, I think definitely a lot of people the college education certainly does not guarantee a job like it did at one time and especially in the area that i work and you know with students interested in music and entertainment you know it, it there is no guarantee in that world and the best students don't even get the best jobs sometimes it's the person with the best personality in, in, the, in the entertainment field and so sometimes it's the kid without a college degree so you know it, it's got to be something that your family can commit to you can commit to and count the cost and um but it's definitely not for everyone i know there's a lot of people that are anti becoming anti-college especially in the last couple of years with, with the pandemic and certainly a lot of students don't feel like they got much value during the pandemic with zoom classes and no online meetings and you know, i even had a graduating class you know two years ago didn't even, never even had a graduation ceremony and that, that was mm -hmm. hard for them so but i think there's there is value and like for, you know like i said for belmont the greatest value i think is beyond the classroom and it really comes through that collaborative community of creatives that you get immersed into not only your age but even other creatives who are out there professionally working and you just you know, Nashville's great for that. It, it's it's very different than Los Angeles or New York because it's it's a smaller city and that creative community is built in tightly. So there, yeah. So I, I think it all comes down to what's the assignment from the Lord, and and I think that's really where you've got to focus. So you saying Nashville, uh, and you lived in L.A. right before when you were with Word, and yeah. you were the A and R in Nashville. Is that, I mean, you were in L.A. Correct. Yes. So, uh, of course, a lot's changed over the years in Nashville. When I was a young man, it used to be, you know, country music uh, USA or city USA. Now it's just music city or whatever. I think it's music city USA or whatever. But uh, do you see Nashville really becoming kind of the new central coast or the, the epicenter for uh, especially music as a whole? Because I know a lot of I mean, I've, I've heard Peter Frampton lives here and Steve yeah. Winwood. Uh, I'm a huge Steve. If I ever see Steve Winwood, you know, I'll speak to Steve Winwood. I'm a huge Steve Winwood fan. Uh, but, you know, at the hardware show I shop at sometimes, I said, hey, do you ever see anybody in here? And they go, hey, you know, Michael McDonald? Yeah. yeah he comes in here. But, yeah. Oh, so, you know, yeah. but it's so it's kind of seems like it's becoming an epicenter. Do you sense that or, or what's your feel on that? More and more so. And I think it's, it's set up for that. Back at, 20 years ago, people kept saying that maybe prematurely. They, they were wanting to believe that was the case. And it's slowly become that. But honestly, now with the pandemic and, and just the difficulties of living in Los Angeles and New York um, economically and socially, I meet someone almost every week who just moved to Nashville in the last month, especially in the music industry. So I think, honestly, in the next five years, you really, I mean, it's already it's becoming that, but I think you're going to see it uh, more and more. Um, just because of, uh, you know, the, the, the living values here and, and, and the economy here. And, um, and it's, it's just an easier place to raise children, I think, than, than those other two primary cities. So I, I think it's growing and I think it's, you're, you're going to see more of it in the next five years. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, there's always going to be certain music genres, the pop, and hip hop genres are, I think, probably already going to stay. Will probably stay primarily focused in those two cities. Um, but it could be wrong. You know, Justin Timberlake's got a house here now. You're seeing more and more people mm -hmm. who are they're they're done. You know, they're done with the West Coast or whatever, and they they love coming here and and buying ten acre farms. You know, and so I think you're going to see more and more of that. It's cool, and and you know, from um, just what I've personally seen. People, regardless of social status, they're just very kind here, very nice people. Uh, even going to the county to get my driver's license when we moved here, uh, the woman on the phone called me hun. I sure. thought, no, wait, this is a different place, you know, <laughs> uh, because I was never addressed as hun uh, in Tarrant County, Texas. Uh, but uh, let me ask you, uh, I want to read this, and it's, it's about 30 seconds. My wife timed time me on it, but I think it's probably the most profound uh, and provocative statement in your book. Um, to experience success and in an effort to obey God, the lens of serving must become the basis for all our daily decision making and our major life assignments, which comes out of our desire to please and honor God. And it flows from out of deep love for his son, 
and his cross where he sacrificially and beautifully demonstrated his identification with our pain and brokenness. Then serving is not just about shining our light on others. It's about the beauty of his light burning deep inside us that attracts us to others and is attractive to others. Now we can begin to change the world one person at a time. You just need to care. And I want to commend you, Mark. That That is a powerful statement. It is provocative, I think, to some. Uh, but I think even what comes through in our conversation here today is your transparency, your, your legitimacy, and that you just are who you are. You're not on a campaign to to prove a point or to be something, uh, but that you're willing to make your uh, personal beliefs known and how it governs your life. And also as an encouragement, of course, through this entire book to encourage others to think about, you know, moving in that direction themselves. But uh, it's been four years since the book was first um, established. And uh, just share with me, uh, if it's known about you publicly, I think you've already answered that, uh, the fact that you're not hiding. And so I kind of maybe am redundant with that question. But I did want to read that statement because I think it's profound. You know, people talk about shining a light on others, but ultimately the light that we have to shine comes through him. You know, and a lot of us, you know, a lot of people that don't know Christ, you can find some of the most charitable people in the world, organizations, people, but it really, for it to be sustainable and long lasting and to really have an impact, it's got to be coming from a place of, of Christ's light. Um, otherwise, you burn out. It, it becomes exhausted. Things get broken in that process, you know, and, and honestly, I think the greatest thing that you can give someone is is the gospel and, and the truth of of Christ. And I think that no matter how much we serve and give, that's all great. But I think we also have to give the the recognition of of Christ being the way, the truth, and the life for all of us. But that one person at a time thing is is interesting because I think a lot of people maybe even some of your audience listening to this right now, they may feel, gosh, I, you know, I never, I never had enough money to go to college. You know, I don't have a, a network of people to work from. I don't have resources. I have limited resources. Yet I feel like God's placed in me this big dream. He's given me this assignment, something I'm going to change the world with, but I don't even how, know how to get there from here, from this point without all those other things. And my wife has always had the greatest reminder for me in this, you know, because I'll, I'll come home from Belmont some weeks and it's a big sacrifice to be there with students, you know, in the evenings on top of my law practice during the days. And sometimes I come home and I'm just like, gosh, I just feel like I'm pouring all this out. And am I having any impact? And my wife always looks at me and she's like, Mark, it's one student at a time. Oof. It's one person at a time, you know, because we always have these things. We, we, we all want to be a world changer and, and do these big things in our life. But it really comes down to one person at a time. And you know what? You change one person today. Maybe tomorrow will change two. Maybe the next day you'll change three. But part of it is beginning to say, OK, God, you've given me this gift. You've given me this passion. You've given me this assignment. I'm not going to wait till I have 100,000 Instagram followers. I'm not going to wait till I have a million followers on YouTube. I'm not going to wait until I get the big book publishing contract or the big record deal. I'm going to start doing that thing you've given me today, even if it's only for that one person sitting in front of me having a coffee, uh, you know, and begin to do it then. And so I think that's a great way for all of us to live, you know, is, is to recognize. And I think it's interesting because as we do that, God gives us more, you know, as we're as we can live with the assignment, being that one person sitting across the table with us having the coffee and we pour as much into them as if we were standing on a stage, you know, speaking to 5000 people. But you bring the same sort of passion and conviction. God honors that. And he blesses that. And, he, and he'll begin to multiply that in his in his in his timing. And so um, and I still because even today I still will go, gosh, is this really you know, you know, even with my book, has it really had the impact that I wanted it to have? But but I see. And, you know, it, one of the most fulfilling things is I one of the things I did is I, I did a um, 
a devotional through the U version, the, the Bible app. So you can actually, there's an eight page devotional that goes with my book. And after I put it out, I just thought the Lord showed me, you got to put that in Spanish. So I had it translated in Spanish. And I get emails almost monthly from people all over the world, from Spanish speaking countries, telling me how much my little devotional for my book meant to them. And oftentimes they'll write me in Spanish. So then I got to use the Google translator to read it. But to know someone in Guatemala or Spain, someone who's starting a business and trying to do it right and to do it uh, with godly principles that somehow my words has impacted them in that Spanish speaking country, that is fulfilling, you know? And, you know, maybe my book hasn't sold hundreds of thousands or millions of copies, but knowing that it's had those certain people that it's, it's, it's influenced them, you know? And some of it's been surprising, you know, it's like, I, you know, I, I thought my book was written to 18 to 30 year olds, but a couple of years ago, I had a guy who was a big, um, he worked for Lockheed for years and he was a salesman selling major aircraft parts and that sort of thing. And he flew down to Nashville to take me to lunch. And he just wanted to tell me, you know, I just got to tell you, and he's, this gentleman was older than me. He goes, I read your book and the principles in your book about serving and where you find success it's what I've been trying to teach my sales teams for 40 years at Lockheed. And it's like, wow, thank you. <laughs> he goes, I just, I couldn't put it all into words, but you put it a lot of it into words, the things I've been trying. So just to know that my book has made it into hands from, from all the way to a 22 year old in Guatemala to, to a former head of sales at Lockheed. That's fulfilling to know that it's, it's encouraged people, you know, and, um, and, and, and I really, I really believe what I'm talking about in there, because I've experienced from my own and some of the stories I tell in the book about where I've gone to things with it. With I got my pockets filled with business cards, and I've walked into those things to man. I'm going to make the connections, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have all these new opportunities, only to feel like the Lord's hand of resistance in those, and for Him to say, "What did you give at that event? Who did you pray for? Who did you speak to?" And to come away from that going, Lord, I. I I'm sorry, I, I won't ever do that again. I, that was so, I don't know what I was thinking. I was trying to build my law practice and my business on the world's principles. Ooh. And um, so I've learned that, you know, myself. And if I can share that with some of these college students and, and young uh, business executives starting companies in Nashville, it's a, it's a real honor to be able to hopefully set them on, on that path early on in their careers. Our parent organization that sponsors this is Transform This City, transformthecity.org. And our byline is uh, you know, transforming uh, cities, you know, one life at a time. And uh, it's always been the same thing for me, one life at a time. And uh, I always live in hopes that we never know uh, that one life that we touch may become a world changer. Yeah. And uh, we, we know stories throughout history of people like that. I've done a lot of funerals in my life and uh, standing at the graveside, I always talk to people because, you know, they're all out there facing you. And I always share that every person standing here goes to bed at night with their head on their pillow, wondering, does somebody care? Does somebody care about me? Yeah. And it's pro does somebody care about me? And everyone's facing me, you know, it's daylight and people crying and they're shaking their heads. Yes. Yeah. And, and really what you're talking about and what you share in your book is caring for people, each individual and investing in them as you have opportunity and being intentional about it. And it is transformative. And I can testify to that. We're, we're coming up on about 10 minutes left, but uh, just real quickly. Uh, I think you've already talked about really kind of your approach to your devotional life. I think it shows through and everything we've already said. Uh, we've got just a couple more minutes Okay. If I can, I want to ask you, because if I understand in your book and folks, this is in uh, the book Net networking kills uh, that you actually met and were in the same recording studio with Johnny Cash. Is that correct? It is. It is. You got to tell me a little bit, brother. Okay. I mean, yeah, I, I would, I'm, I'm a huge Johnny Cash fan. Oh, yeah. This is this is my favorite music business story that I try to remember to tell every class I teach at Belmont because I've got some great stories. But this is sort of the best one, I think, in terms of. Uh, just a great memory. So I was living in Los Angeles. I was working with a Christian punk band out of Austin called One Bad Pig back in, <laughs> back in the late 80s, early 90s. And back in the early 90s, there was a trend in music back then 
now everybody now you go to see a concert a lot of people will close a concert with a cover song right it's sort of a trend but back then people would put one cover song on their records it was just kind of the trend so we were trying to figure out okay is there a good cover song we could you know they have all their songs and i said to them hey what why don't you guys do a punk version of johnny cash's man in black and they listened to it and they're like yes we are they were so excited they weren't even familiar with it they're like we're doing it we're going to do a punk band. and i said well better yet why don't we see if we can get johnny to sing on it they're like oh yeah right like that would ever happen come on there's no way and i said i take that as a challenge and so i began back then it was pre-email so i began sending letters to johnny cash's management company here in nashville and i sent them cds of one bad pig letters i sent them four or five different letters over a three month period different things and finally got a phone call and manager says you know johnny really likes this group and he would really like to see if he can make this work i'm like are you kidding and i'm like i'm thinking first off i don't have a big record budget he goes no don't worry about that that's not even an issue and so we come out here to record the record in nashville with a producer and um i talked to the manager we're like we're here recording is it, you think this is possible that johnny might come down and sing on this version of his song with this punk band and he says well you know mark i'm really sad to tell you but johnny's mom has been she's dying and she's in the very last days of her life and he's sort of spending day and night at her if you've seen the movie walk the line you'll remember his mom in that movie he's spending day day and night with his mom i don't know uh, if it's going to work out but he said listen this friday night his his um his his son um john carter jr they're throwing a big party for his 21st birthday why don't you and one bad pig the punk band come on down to the party and uh you know we'll get you in everybody's going to be there which you're going what does that mean who is everybody so we walk into this party and everybody was there bill monroe um you know the guys from the oak ridge boys they're all there and not only is this fun party but they're all getting up on stage and they're playing songs it's like this one is playing with that one and and right there in the middle of the crowd is uh is johnny and june and so uh june was feeling a little bit under the weather that night so about halfway through the party johnny walks her out to take her back home early and the manager says hey i want to make sure you get to to meet them so he took the band and i outside the the building and we got to talk to johnny and june for a few minutes and he you know he said you know i really want to sing on this record i just don't know that it's going to work out with where my mom is and i'm really sorry and and the band was able to just talk to him and they talked to him about his his he wrote a book on uh uh, Paul years ago called The Man in White, which the lead singer of the band had was one of his favorite books. He'd, he'd been reading it and just was in love with it. So they talked about that. And then he said, but yeah, just the band was like, hey, no worries. Just the fact that we got to meet you, shake your hand. Thank you so much. He goes, I'm glad you guys have come to the party. I hate to leave early. So he leaves. The band ends up getting on stage and playing later. And they did their little punk set with all the, the country artists in the room. I don't know if they knew what to make of One Bad Pig. We went back to recording the very last day of recording in nashville we're getting ready to leave i'm flying back to los angeles the band's going back to austin the manager calls the very last day and said hey you know what johnny just feels like he really wants to try to That's get true. there for this can you guys possibly still record him i said and i'm like well we've already started mixing the record we're not set up to record but if he's coming down here we'll get set up to record right now <laughs> so he drove down he comes down to the studio walks in and he's exhausted you know with his mom i think his mom passed about two days later at this point so he comes in and it was beautiful he, he just he was so vulnerable with his mom where she was um the band got to pray for him encourage him you know and he just had a great couple hours with us doing mm -hmm. this session and and singing the song and it just it was such a sweet time he was such a down, as you would imagine as down to earth as you can possibly imagine and just so kind and that he would come and serve this little no-name band from austin and put his name on their record was just he believed in what they were doing he knew they were christians he knew what they were up to what their mission was and he believed it what was interesting we found out years later which we no one would even have known this at the time that was during a couple of years he had been dropped from columbia records 
it was before Rick Rubin started making those amazing records with him. So he was a man without a home. He didn't even have a record label at that point. And I think he was going through a period of like, is my career over? Am I done? Is that it? No one wants to even sign me anymore. So to even get a call from a punk band from Austin to record with them, I think was something that was appealing. Just like, man, here's some young guys that appreciate who Johnny Cash is. I want to go sing on their record. So flash forward, that was 1991. Um, this is the end of the story, which is really fun because I'm, I'm standing in my Belmont class and I, I try to remember, to, I don't always remember to tell this story because I just, I love it. It just had such a huge impact on, on me. I was telling this story to a class, a freshman class at Belmont. And, and I noticed one of my students has his phone out and he's, um, I didn't know what he was doing, but he was kind of holding it towards me. Well, then we walk through at the classes over and you're all going, oh, Professor Maxwell, what a great story. We love Johnny Cash and thank you for telling us that. Can't believe you got to meet him. And I showed him my pictures with Johnny Cash and everything. And, um, and then as we're walking out, one of the students, he says, you, you know, and this is the guy who was holding the phone, you know who he is, right? I'm like, no, his name is Joseph Cash. He said, that's Johnny's grandson. And I'm like, you are, so the, we, the whole semester I had no idea that Joseph was sitting there in my class and there I was telling this story about his grandfather. He goes, man, I can't wait to share this with my dad that you were at my dad's 21st birthday party. So it was, it was one of those little full circle moments that was really fun. Um, had no idea. And, you know, he didn't advertise that he was Johnny's grandson, but it was, it was really sweet to get to get to know him, have him in class too. So. I tell you, he was a big man, wasn't he? He's like six, four, probably. Do you think? Yeah. Yes. I saw his, uh, you know, my son, before we moved here, he gave us a uh, tickets to the wax museum, wherever that thing is. And, uh, they had, uh, Johnny Cash's clothes and, you know, back in the day when he was thin, I mean, he was long and tall and lean. Oh but, yeah. Uh, I tell you, I love his, uh, Trent Reznor, you know, the song hurt. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, I watched Reznor talk about it. And he said, when they first came to him on what they were wanting to do, he's like, mm, no. And then when they played it for him, he's like, oh, I get it. Yeah. Uh, really amazing how it, it really kind of meshed with Johnny Cash's life and the fact that he was willing to do that yes. uh, at the end of his life. But uh, he had such you, an impact on so many people. I remember him seeing him at you know, the Billy Graham crusade when I was a kid, you know, I think probably in Dallas somewhere. And um, our first pastors at um, a church called First Baptist Hearst, I remember first time I heard Johnny Cash was with the pastor's son up in their rec room. And he played me, um, I think it was either the San Quentin or the other prison record. And uh, I remember for some reason, I mean, I was probably five or six years old, but I always remember that first time I heard Johnny Cash. So, yeah. Hey, we've got one minute left. We're going to hold to it. We got started a little bit late with some technical glitches, but just uh, this is, so this is like a one minute fire off round. Okay. That's been amazing to talk to you and very, uh, inspiring, entertaining. Uh, but let me ask you, okay. Cause I know that you're a big Bob Dylan fan, David Byrne, Bob Marley, but in just a word, tell me, of course, I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan, huge David bird fan, Byrne fan. And I saw on Instagram where you were at the concert here, oh, but, yeah. uh, tell me just because, you know, you really, what I view is also kind of a musicologist really. Uh, so in a nutshell, just as we close, uh, in a sentence, what you think is so phenomenal about Bob Dylan, David Byrne, and Bob Marley? Those three. Could you do that? Just oh my gosh, yeah. Those, those three. I mean, they're all certainly amazing innovators. You know, Bob Dylan. You know, I think is the greatest. Well, he's certainly the greatest American songwriter who's ever lived. He might be the greatest songwriter who, who ever has lived. What makes him so relevant is, you know, a number of different things. He was, you know, the most influential folks of the sixties were JFK, Martin Luther King Jr. And Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan's the only one who's still around, you know, 60 years later. Um, and what I think makes him so relevant is at 81 years old, he's out touring right now on his most recent record that some people say is the best record he has made since 1975's blood on the tracks. And so to see a man now McCartney's out too, and McCartney's great, but McCartney hasn't made a record that good since band on the run and i and i love the beatles and i love paul mccartney but bob is still writing at a level that's just it's, it's unbelievable to be writing the kind of songs he's writing at age, age 81. so um bob marley i mean i think 
you know, now people would argue that he didn't single-handedly create a genre of music, but I would argue that without him, I don't think any of us would be listening to reggae music around the world. And, um, you know, he's such a uh, influence, obviously in Jamaica, but I think the thing about Bob Marley is it just, he, he sort of transcends time. The music doesn't sound dated. I think you'll, I think kids will be listening to Bob Marley a hundred years from now. And that's, you know, something about it, it, it coincides with sunny weather and the beach and sunshine. And I know for me, once May and June hits, I don't care if I mean <laughs> how far I, I am away from the beach. If it's a beautiful sunny day and I want to feel good driving in my car, Bob Marley's music comes on. And so Bob just, Marley. it changes, it, it changes the mood and mm -hmm. it sets the mood and the overall music that he wrote was just, it, it's unlike anything else. Um, and David Byrne was such an innovator. I think, um, you know, I, I think you got to give the rest of the band credit. I think a lot of times people overlook the rest of the talking heads and people overlook Brian Eno, who produced all those records. Yeah. Um, without all those, I don't know that we would be talking about David Byrne, but certainly David Byrne, you know, to, to still take what he does and bring it back out on Broadway in the last couple of years. Um, you know, there, there there's probably a couple of those records that he did with Talking Heads. I don't know that you can find many rock records since those early records, um, you know, that are better. You know, um, I, I think in some ways, a couple of those records have, and they, even though it's 80s style, it, it definitely has stood the test of time. So definitely an innovator. Um, all three quirky individuals, um, you know, I, I know some people feel like Bob Marley knew Christ. I hope that was the case. Um, I think um, people I know that know Dylan uh, still say that he reads his Bible every day. And so it definitely that is out. A slow train yeah. coming. Yeah, he, it definitely comes in he, even in his his most recent album in the rough and rowdy ways. There's so much there's so many allusions to scripture. Uh, so, you know, definitely pray that he'll he'll will continue to get to hear him. Uh, for all eternity uh, in person, you know, which will be nice. So, uh, yeah. So uh, Dave Byrne, same as it ever was, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I tell you, just amazing. One of my favorite TV shows is Northern Exposure. And uh, they feature one of his songs, Burning Down the House. Uh, the, whole ep the whole episode is about uh, one of the key stars, her home gets uh, accidentally, you know, torched to the ground. Uh, but the burning down the house was the, the theme for it, but I love it. But Mark, man, I tell you what, you have been amazing. I deeply appreciate your time and uh, such an encouragement. And, and let me say, uh, this is going to be available on YouTube, on uh, other things with, and the way you find it right, right now, it will be found under other things with Mark Maxwell uh, to actually have a, a home base with a, a definite URL you have to have a really huge audience. Uh, you can't just get that or buy it. Uh, but I have found out the last video interview I did that when I typed in, you know, other things with and your name, it comes right up, which is pretty cool. Uh, also to say that that this video uh, is seen all over the world. And I'm astounded at the people uh, really all over the world uh, that are tapping in and uh, part what Part of the, the, the push we're going to be giving with this is through our AdWords campaign that we have access to through Google. Uh, as a nonprofit, they actually have a grant that's available to anyone. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge grant every month. But my goal is for people to hear your story and who are in places of despair or they're coming to a place of hopelessness that life can ever be any different or better. And uh, you've definitely, through your book, uh, networking kills and then also in your your speaking today definitely communicate that regardless of what you've been through what's going on right now there is always hope yes. and the hope is in god ultimately uh, but because this is his world he wants us to succeed and uh, mark has given a great roadmap on how to do that but anyway thank you so much mark and uh, hopefully down the road maybe we can uh, if you're up to it and can put aside the time uh maybe we can just talk about uh, musicians and uh, your feedback because I deeply cherish it. That'd be great. Kenny. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor to be with you. I really appreciate it.